China's medieval period covers a number of important dynasties, but the two most important ones we want to talk about are the Tang and the Song dynasty. Uh, the Han dynasty was the last one we talked about, and you might recall that in the 3rd century the Han dynasty collapsed. Uh, this led to a brief period called the Three Kingdoms, where there wasn't really a single dynasty that controlled all of what had been um, Han China. And in between the 3rd and the 6th centuries, there are almost 30 different dynasties which controlled parts of China. But the first one to mostly reunite it was the Sui dynasty in the 6th century. And this was an important dynasty um, in reunifying China, but didn't last very long. And in 618, it gave way to the Tang dynasty. Uh, the Tang dynasty was one of China's um, more important long-lasting dynasties, especially here in the Middle Ages. Um, so the Tang reunified China, and in fact they extended Chinese territory out into uh, Central Asia and further north uh, beyond where the, uh, the Han had gone. Um, so this is a very large territory. Uh, they reintroduced a lot of the cultural and political aspects that had existed during the Han Dynasty. Uh, one of the most important ones was Confucianism. Um, you might recall that uh, the Han Dynasty had basically adopted Confucianism with sort of a legalist bent as the, uh, the main philosophy for not only their kingdom but society. And that continued to be the case. And um, by using uh, Confucianism and Confucian scholars as um, you know, government institution, this created a new social class that's going to be a long-lasting uh, group in China, and that's the gentry. Uh, gentry are in, in China are the upper class. Um, they're defined by basically two things: the ownership of land and their education. Um, the civil service exam was reinstituted in the Tang Dynasty, and all members of the gentry sort of had to go through that. Um, that system, which required lots of education in the first place. Uh, and they all end up dominating the, uh, the social and political life in China. Um, the Tang Dynasty fell in 907, and there's a brief uh, interregnum period uh, where there's no single dynasty that controlled China until uh, Emperor Taizu reunified China in 960 under the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty really continued most of the, the same traditions the Tang had, although they never really restored their size. Um, they were much smaller than the Tang Dynasty. But they continued the traditions of Confucianism uh, and they extended trade along the Silk Road as the Tang had. Both the Tang and Song Dynasty are considered a golden age for China. You saw a flourishing of poetry by poets like Li Bo, who are celebrated uh, throughout Chinese culture, uh, as well as art. Um, with trade along the Silk Road came a lot of new cultures and religions. So Islam and Buddhism uh, both entered China. Um, Taoism became more popular. And you see that reflected in a lot of the art, uh, like the statue here. Uh, innovation and technology was also a great legacy of the Tang and Song dynasty. Um, a lot of these, these discoveries and inventions will be exported. So for example, on the Silk Road, um, you could get porcelain, uh, silk, um, the magnetic compass, gunpowder, all these things eventually made their way west. Um, and they became very important not only for the economy of China, um, but also they'll affect the economies of other parts of the world. Uh, and you can see how some of these things, like the magnetic compass, for example, uh, when we get to the period of exploration in Europe, it's only because they have new technologies like the compass. And then you get the period of warfare in Europe in the 16th century, it's because of the innovation of gunpowder. Uh, movable type, which isn't going to come to Europe until uh, much later was an inventor during the Tang Dynasty. Uh, paper money was first issued in China um, under the, the Tang and Song Dynasties. And the Song Dynasty uh, innovated uh, new ways to sort of crossbreed plants. They developed rice strains, for instance, that could grow with very little water um, and, and increase their yields. So all these innovations are really important legacies of the Tang and Song Dynasties. Um, Looking at society, again, an important thing to keep in mind is that um, while China was very large and, in fact, one of the most populous cities in the world during the Middle Ages was uh, Chang'an, the capital of the Tang Dynasty, uh, a lot of the power is concentrated in the upper class among these gentry. And that's going to be a mark of Chinese society throughout um, the imperial period all the way until the 
20th century. Uh, the role of women was sort of in flux during this period. Um, some consider the Tang Dynasty to be sort of a golden age for women um, in that they had more rights. They could, um, for example, here's a, a famous poet from uh, the Tang period. Um, during the Song Dynasty, one of China's few reigning emperors, Wu Zetan, um, ruled. Um, but those were really limited to the upper class, and so lower class women often didn't have a lot of the same luxuries. Um, and in fact, the practice of foot binding, um, where women's feet are from birth um, sort of mutilated to be very, very small, um, which was supposed to be a mark of upper class society, that started during the period of the Tang Dynasty too. So you had to sort of have that, that contradiction of both uh, more freedom also uh, more limited rights. Um, and so all these innovations together become um, sort of the legacy of the Tang and Song dynasty.